Good morning, everybody. It is wonderful to see you guys. Thanks for being here. Week two and de-stressing your distress, okay? Uh, last week, we kicked off. We were talking about starting with Matthew chapter 6 in this incredible sermon of Jesus where he starts off talking about doing good things, giving to others, meeting people's needs, but there's a wrong way to do that. There is a right way to do that. There's a, right, a wrong way to do that. You do it wrong, it is gonna stress you out. It's gonna make you a prisoner of people pleasing. And if you miss that, I encourage you to go back and check it out. Now, we did verses one through four last week, so that be the logical place to pick up would be verse five, right? So, but verse five through 15, all about prayer. We have already covered this just about four or five months ago, back in the spring, we did a series entitled, How to Pray, okay? Maybe some of you remember this. Here is a QR code. If you'd like to scan that, it'll take you directly to the series. Uh, I've already preached on that this year, so I thought, I'm gonna let you check that out if you'd like to, but Jesus talks about there's a right and a wrong way to pray. And that there were a lot of people that said this really helped them. This created some great spiritual breakthrough, really brought some clarity to their prayer life, and really opened the door for like, okay, now I know what I need to do next, just simply by breaking down what we would call the Lord's Prayer. I mean, Jesus gave us some beautiful insight here. So I encourage you, check that out. If you just want a refresher, check that out. It's on our website, brothersfellowship.com, or you can do the QR code and get there immediately. All right, so we're going to pick up on verse 16 today, and 16 starts uh, this whole discussion about fasting. Now, let me just say this real quick before we go any further. Jesus, throughout this sermon, especially this part of it, he's giving us a series of warnings, and these warnings are there to help us to keep from slipping out or adopting a lifestyle that's going to cause us to live outside of the kingdom of God. When you look at the pattern of Jesus, what he called the good news, what he came to preach, it was always the kingdom of God has come near and it is available to you now. Not someday when you die, when you get to heaven. So it's, it's right now. Everybody's invited. And you can begin to walk in it, live in it right now. Now, there are things that keep us from the kingdom. There are things that block us from doing what we've been created to do and live the way God created us to live. And these are the things Jesus seems to be going after in this part of the sermon. And one of the religious activities of the first century kind of lost on us today. Not, not everybody's really versed on this idea of fasting. We're going to talk about it today. And I know some of you are going, oh, dang, I picked the wrong Sunday to come to church. I don't want to fast. I'm like already hungry for lunch right now. I want, if anything, I want more food, not less, okay? But let me, just, let me just ask you to pump the brakes there because I think there's something here for you. I think there's something here for everybody. It's just, uh, just on par with everything Jesus teaches. It's so powerful when we put it in its context and understand how it applies to us today. Okay, let's begin with this question. How does fasting, or pardon me, does fasting really make a difference? The answer to this, Jesus thought so. Okay, But as you look at the full counsel of Scripture, all the Old Testament, all the New Testament, God does not demand or command us to fast today. But every time fasting is presented in Scripture, it is always good, profitable, and beneficial to us. So the next question we should probably ask is, why? Why should we fast? Like, what's, what's the point? And here's the point. That through fasting, we're able to access something that we can't have without it. For spiritual power, clarity, and guidance from God. 
This is what fasting can offer to us. This is what it opens up to us. Now, there might be some area in your life right now, a relationship, finances, career, planning for the future, your kids, whatever. You could use some more spiritual power, clarity, and guidance. This might be something you need to sit up straight, take notes, and, and really uh, think about God might be prompting your heart. I know you've never done this before, or it's been a long time, but this is something I'd like you to consider. Now, both Old and New Testament, we see fasting as a part of the story of God's people. In the Old Testament book of Esther, Queen Esther asks all the Israelites to fast and pray for three days before she goes and risks her life to save her people before King Xerxes. God answers the prayer big time. I, spoiler alert, right? The end of the book is really good. You need to go back and read that. It's a great story, but God answers big time. In the New Testament... In Acts chapter 13, this is one of those stories that always stands out to me so big time when I think about prayer and fasting. It was a a time when the disciples had come together in the church of Antioch and trying to pursue God for guidance, direction. They were trying to make a big decision. What are we supposed to do next? And a part of that prayer group of prayer and fasters was Paul and Barnabas. And it was through that prayer that God said, I want you to set aside for me Paul and Barnabas. And it started the first missionary journey of the apostle Paul which he went on to have multiple. But it was an incredibly huge next step for the church to say, Let's, it's time to take this gospel, this good news, to the whole known world. Let's, let's begin to do that. And that took a lot of courage, and that was that big step. But it happened from people fasting and praying. They fasted and prayed. These things always seemed to go together. Fasting was never done without the pursuing God through prayer, right? So um, saying that, is there the question that I think we need to ask that he's kind of prompting his audience going into the sermon is, is there a wrong way to fast? Like, should, should we be careful about the way we fast? And actually, the answer is yes. Once again, there is a right and wrong way to give, to help other people. There's a right and wrong way to pray, and there is a right and wrong way to fast. These were very common religious activities of Jesus' day. So he's going to give us some really clear counsel and teaching on how to do this. So let's take a look at what Jesus says next. He says, this is in Matthew 6, um, chapter 6, verse 16. He says, and when you fast. Now, again, it's not a command, but Jesus' assumption is there's going to be a time in your life when you're going to need to fast. There's going to be times, there'll be seasons when you're going to need extra power, clarity, and guidance from God, and here's what you're to do, okay? He says, don't make it, let's say it together, don't make it obvious. Don't be overt with it, as the hypocrites do, right? Last week, we kind of camped out on this word. This, from its original kind of etymological origins, was a word that meant actor, stage actor, somebody under a mask. Jesus single-handedly took this word that meant actor, and he made it into someone who is a deceiver, who has one face out here, but deep down, there's somebody else on the inside. And those people we still call hypocrites, right? They put on a good show, they perform really well, but their heart is really not in it, right? And he's saying, and he's talking about the Pharisees, the religious Jewish leaders of his day. He's saying, don't do it like the hypocrites. So what did the hypocrites do that was so wrong about their fasting? For they try to look miserable, and disheveled so people will let's say it together will admire them for their fasting it's just like oh oh, man it's tough being this holy (laughs) hashtag fasting for jesus today i hope i get a lot of likes comments you know followers off of that jesus is saying whoa 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 pump the brake that is not the right reason Because your audience has shifted from God to whom? People. You're doing it for them. Jesus is saying that. That's the wrong way to do it. And as a matter of fact, it's not just wrong. It will stress you out. It will make you an anxiety-ridden person because people are fickle. 
people are here today, gone tomorrow. They will not, it is a horrible object or purpose to live for, the approval, the applause of people. And Jesus is showing us, don't fall into, this is a trap, this is a rut that many people fall into. He says, so I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. Jesus reminds us again, the audience we choose will derive the, the reward that we get. Whatever audience we're performing for, that is where our reward will come from. And we have to take a step back and say, okay, whether we're talking about fasting or any other religious activity, you're giving, you're helping, all these things could be good, they're all good things, but Jesus would say, you, I, I'm begging you to ask the question, who is your audience? Who are you really doing it for? Whose eye are you hoping to capture by these activities? Later, the Apostle Paul, I think in Colossians and in Galatians, he takes this idea and he, he presents this new Greek word that means to, to give eye service. You're just doing this because their eye is on you. In other words, you have become a slave to the eyes of people. You're not going to do or you are going to do things just because you think, well, somebody's watching. Jesus says, don't live like that. That, that, you want to be a person with anxiety that, that has to be medicated for it, that constantly has, you're constantly thinking about what are other people thinking and how, do they approve and are they okay with what I'm doing? Jesus, as we looked at last week, he's like, I love all you people, but I do not entrust my heart, my approval, my affirmation from you. I perform only for an audience of one. I have come only to please the one who sent me. God himself, and you would be wise to follow in my footsteps. The moment you make people the audience of your life, it is a crazy maker. And you will find it, you, it's impossible, first of all, and you will drive yourself into the ground trying to make it possible. And so, who is your audience? Whose eye is really on you? Jesus goes on to say in verse 17, he says, but when you fast, here he says it again, not if, but when you fast, and he's talking to his followers. If you consider yourself a Christ follower, a Christian, you're a disciple of Jesus, this is, this is for you. If you're still considering it, he's gonna show us the right way to do it. But when you fast, he's like, comb your hair, wash your face. Like, this is so practical. It's so like, that just makes sense. Do your regular routine. Don't look disheveled. Don't look miserable. Don't try to garner the attention of other people through your religious activity. Do it only and completely unto God. Then, if you do it like that, then no one will notice that you're fasting. Like, that's a good thing. Accept your Father who knows what you do, um, know you, uh, pardon me, who knows what you do in, let's say it together, in private. Now, that might make some of us nervous. He knows everything I do in private. Yes, he knows everywhere you go online. He knows everything you look at. He knows everything that comes out of your mouth, even when no one's around. He knows everything that you binge watch. He knows everything, and he loves you anyway. That ought to say a lot, right? He loves you anyway. He loves you so much. And your father, who sees everything, he's going to reward you. And his reward, ladies and gentlemen, can never be taken away. Never be taken away. It's not fickle like people's reward. It's not an applause that you get for a little while, a few comments. And those are wonderful. That's nice. Just don't do it for that, right? That's wonderful. He's just saying this is no way to live, and this is not a kingdom way to live. Now, let me give you a quick history for Israel in terms of their, their history with fasting, just to kind of catch you up to speed. God did command the nation of Israel one time, one day a year to fast. Back in uh, Leviticus chapter 23, I think it's 32, where he tells them on the day of atonement, um, one day a year, when the uh, chief priest comes into the temple, sacrifices for the sins of all of God's people to put them back in right relationship with God, on that day I want you to abstain from all things for your body. 
right? So this is what he says, one day out of the year. The Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, who loved to have the approval, the attention, uh, uh, the eyes of people, they said, well, we see you're once a year. If that's not near enough. We're going to do twice a week. So every Monday and Thursday, they fasted all day, and they did it big in public. And they would moan and groan, and whoo, it's hard being this holy, man. Whoa, yeah, like, wow, this is tough. And they would, uh, you know, everybody that would see them was like, oh, man, look, look, how, look how holy that guy is right there, man. We'll never be as holy as that guy right there. He's, a, man, just really incredibly close to Jesus and, or close to God. And Jesus came along and said, actually not. <laughs> that's not, that's not pleasing to God at all because they're doing it for the wrong reason, the wrong um, audience, they want to be admired. Be careful. Stay away from this. So let me give you a concise, brief de definition of fasting before we go any further. Fasting is simply to go without food in order to seek God. To go without food in order to seek God. Now, I tell you that to say, because sometimes I hear people say, hey, Pastor Will, I've I'm fasting, I'm fasting from my cell phone, social media, on, I'm the, the TV, online shopping, I hear this sometimes, and, and, and that, those are, that's great stuff, right? But that, technically, biblically speaking, is not fasting, that's abstinence, that's abstaining from something, it's also a very powerful and really great spiritual practice, but it's not technically fasting. Fasting is simply um, denying your body food, right? It's denying your fight. It's not giving your body, your flesh, what it wants in the moment. Now, this is, this is very different, um, and now you can also do, you can abstain from things and do very much the same thing, and I know sometimes people, because of medical reasons, maybe say, I can't, technically I can't fast, maybe diabetics say, uh, that fasting is really not an option for me, but you could abstain from something, right? And what that does, let me just say this, it's not because, fasting is not here because your body's evil. There, there has been philosophical thought throughout the history of humankind that kind of fell into that. But it's not true. God made this body. It is a gift to us. And its cravings, its desires, it's, it all, when in brought in alignment with God and his design, his creative, brilliant order for it, is a blessing, but brought outside of that can be a devastating nightmare for us, right? So fasting is simply a way to recruit the body back as an ally instead of an enemy in this fight with the flesh, with this fight, as we're going to look at in just a little bit, um, with our sinful nature. And it really is us be learning how to surrender fully to God and finding joy. There is joy to be found in this as we seek Him. And it's brilliant. And let me just say this, too. As when you begin fasting, some of you maybe have never done this before and you're considering it. Maybe this is something I need to probably considered trying, whatever, when you first start it, it's not going to be fun, okay? Let me just tell you something. Whether you're fasting from food or you're abstaining from something else that your body has been regularly had access to and you've gotten it whenever you wanted it, your body is going to act like a little screaming toddler. I want what I want right now, <laughs> It is not going to be happy with you, and it will rebel, and it's going to rebel big time against you, all right? It's going to be really angry with you. I, uh, I, I love this uh, quote from Richard Foster from Celebration of Discipline, where he says, more than any other discipline, fasting reveals the things that control us. The bigger the fight your body puts up against you, the more control it has over you. It is so powerful. When you begin to do this, practice this, it will reveal. It is like few spiritual practices that Jesus gave us are more humbling than fasting because it will reveal what's actually going on. Not just what you say, but where is the power source or the, the power centers in your life actually the brokers that are really controlling some of your decisions you may not even realize are happening. Just deny your body for a little bit and see what happens. Just put that cell phone away for 24 hours, see what happens, right? Like, that's hard. That's not easy for a lot of us, right? 
And so fasting trains our body not to get what it wants. It teaches us we don't have to get what we want in the moment to be happy. And many of us have so accustomed ourselves, and, and I can almost, to getting what we want, and I can almost say it's almost kind of like not your fault, but it is. Like, because we live in a society that gives us exactly what we want, when we want it, how we want it, right when we want it, right? And it's, we've, we're so accustomed to that. When we don't get it, we get furious. We go ballistic. We get upset. We get frustrated. We take it out on other people. And we've got to learn how we can actually be okay by not getting what we want. I love what Dallas Willard wrote, in, uh, or what he said in Living in Christ's Presence. He says, fasting actually teaches us to be sweet when we don't get our way. <laughs> Isn't that good? That you can. Joy is a choice. You can choose that. There is a war going on between your flesh, your body, and the spirit of Almighty God. Now, we see this written about over and over in the epistles of Paul, in his letters to the churches in the New Testament. Over and over, he talks about this. One of the places where he expands on this the most is probably in Galatians chapter 5, where he talks about there is a war, there's a battle that's going on inside of you and me um, for our desires, our heart, and our body and its cravings, its fleshly cravings, are a big part of that battle. Here's what he said in Galatians chapter 5. He says, so I say, walk by the, let's say it together, walk by the Spirit, and he's talking about the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And the Spirit is what is contrary to the flesh. They are in, let's say it together, in conflict. They're at war with one another. He says, make no mistake about it. Your body, until it is trained in righteousness, is not your ally in your, your, your attempt to walk with Jesus and to walk in his kingdom and to live at peace with God's will for your life. It, it's in conflict. They are in conflict with each other. So that, and this is going to sound like so antithetical, so opposite of the culture that we live in today. It may even sound a little un-American, but here's what Paul says. He goes, so that you are not to do whatever you want. As a matter of fact, if you do whatever you want, you will destroy yourself. You will live stressed out. You will live with anxiety. It will, it will cause you to avoid and never fully understand what it means to live in the kingdom of God. It's so powerful to begin to make this decision to say, God, help me to begin to listen to your spirit. Follow what you say. And, and let me just define this idea of flesh here. It's more than just the physical body. It's the desires and cravings of it. The flesh, we gave it a definition. It's a sinful nature are animalistic cravings for self-gratification. Now, let me just say, if you are struggling with any kind of habitual behavioral sin in your life right now, right? Especially men and women, really, anything that is sexual in nature, any kind of sexual addiction, any kind of sexual sin in your life, I want to encourage you, please consider, pray about, think about, incorporating prayer and fasting in your resistance against this addiction, okay? And, and, and here's why I say that. Um, because I have seen it set free so many people. And it's almost like a, I had no idea, Will. I had no idea that, that, that fasting, denying my, my body food over here would help me to become stronger at denying the temptation towards sexual things, what I'm looking at, what I'm engaging in, what I'm falling into over and over, over here. It's like the same body, but the muscle God uses to strengthen over here, it makes you stronger over here. It's crazy. Now, let me just say, this is not a silver bullet. For some of you who have habitual sin in your life that is rooted in woundedness, abuse, hurt, it's going to take longer, and you may need to pursue some Christian counseling, and we can help you with that here at Brazos, but uh, help you find a good counselor. But I'm just saying it's going to take some time, but 
God wants to help set you free. And this is a way, a simple but yet challenging way to be able to do that, okay? And what's interesting, Jesus didn't just teach this, he modeled it. Before Jesus ever launched his public ministry over in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, we see a picture of what Jesus did before he ever started his public ministry. Here's what we're told. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit, and check this out, this is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is leading Jesus to do what? Into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. What? Wait, the, the, the Spirit of God is leading Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Yeah, that's right. It's like Jesus is showing us your convictions aren't worth much if they can't bear up under a load. If they can't survive some resistance, your muscles really, I don't care how big and impressive they look, if they can't hold weight, they're not of any use, right? And this is what Jesus is showing us, that this is an important part of engaging with God and the world around us. We're going to get tempted by the devil. But here's what's so beautiful. 40 days later, 40, 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. That might be the biggest understatement in all of the Bible, right? <laughs> After 40 days, I would eat this table right here, you know, I'd be so hungry. So, but it's interesting that he's denied his body during that time. Now, he's, I'm sure, drinking. He's just not eating. He's drinking water, but he's not, he's not eating during that time. He's seeking his father during that time. And I used to think, well, isn't that just like the devil? After 40 days, he comes to him when he's vulnerable and he's tired, he's weary, and then he comes and tempts him then. But I have come to understand that misunderstands the power, the clarity, and the guidance that comes from fasting. Because when, when, when Jesus knew he was going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil himself, it is precisely at the end of 40 days that he was not at his lowest strength. He was at his crescendo of it. He was at his highest, most powerful, potent point that he could resist and quote scripture at the devil. And he didn't fall and he wasn't a victim. And his audience maintained as his father the whole time. And he was able to walk out of that confrontation unscathed. And it's as though Jesus is showing us, and you can too. This is possible. I'm showing you what is possible in this physical body, on this physical earth. When you are living in this reality, you can do this too. Now, I, I would suggest starting with 40 days. That's, that's quite a chunk to bite off right there. But to turn to God and say, instead of satisfying my flesh instead of eating this meal i'm going to turn to god i'm going to talk to him because i do need his power i do need his guidance i do need his clarity on this, some, some things right and so this is what jesus shows us and let me tell you what fasting is not really quick this is really important fasting isn't jesus giving us the secret to getting in the best shape of your life okay this is not Jesus, like, how to get, you know, to get your, uh, you know, New Year's resolution goal. You know, that's, that, this is not a cleanse. That's not, that's something else, right? That's not what this is. This is about seeking God. Fasting is also not a way to get God to do what we want. It's not a way to manipulate God into, you know, this is, again, when, when people use it this way, that is simply gratifying the flesh once again. It's just giving the body what it wants. It's now it's just trying to recruit this religious activity of fasting. And Jesus is saying, watch out. Don't let that creep in. That will just make it worse for you. And it's going it's to contaminate the waters between you and God. And so in, instead, fasting actually changes us, not God, right? It is through us denying our flesh, crying out to God, God, I need you. I need some clarity. I need guidance. I need power right now that I do not currently have. It is in that posture of humility before God that he will begin to transform us in ways that when we're just in our everyday routine, we don't allow him that kind of access. Finally, fasting is not a way to appear more spiritual than others. Jesus was abundantly clear on this not a way to show off or to 
seem more spiritual. So how should we fast, right? How do you get started? Well, first of all, a fast could simply be a meal. It could be a, a partial, it could be one meal, it could be a partial day fast, a couple of meals, or a, a, cert, a set certain amount of time that you're just like, I'm gonna seek God instead of eating during this time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be in his word. I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna seek him right now. This is what I'm gonna do. Or maybe it's a whole day. It's a 24-hour period, and you can do that different ways. You can go from breakfast to breakfast. I happen to like going from dinner to dinner, the times that I do this. It, you can try it different ways, or it can be multi-day fasts. Again, I wouldn't encourage you to bite off the 40-day, you know, like, oh, I'm gonna be just like Jesus, and that's your first time to ever fast. Like, maybe let's just hold up there just a little bit, right? Especially if you've had any kind of medical issues in your life, I would encourage you to check with a medical professional before you just dive off into a multi, multi, multi-day fast, okay? Just to make sure that you're not doing something that could really hurt you. This is, this is intended for you to be able to seek God, not just to like see how long you can last, okay? That's not, that's not the goal here. Um, so fasting is to be done with a spirit of humility and with a joyful attitude. That it should be something that we're coming before God humbly seeking Him. And I love over in First uh, Peter chapter 5 where he encourages us that God wants us to come with humility. And if we will humble ourselves under his mighty hand, that he will lift us up in due time, that he will raise us up. And this is so powerful that we do this with a joyful attitude. We choose joy, even though our body may be suffering a little bit in the moment. God, I'm pursuing you anyway to humble ourselves, to seek God's help. And when we do this, and when we do this in secret, Jesus promises, he gives us his word, according to Jesus, that God will give you his blessing. You will receive the blessing of God that can never be taken away from you. It is not fickle, it's not here today and gone tomorrow, that the love of God is yesterday, today, and forever always the same. There was a a moment in our history here at Brazos Fellowship that I want to tell you about we used to have our auditorium. Um, it was not always here. Um, some of you may remember years ago, it was on the other side of that tilt wall right over there, okay? It actually looked like this, right? And uh, we had about, probably could seat about 300, 350 people, and that is like really dangerously packed, okay? And as you can see, I wore really bright shirts back then too. God worked in spite of that. Um, so, but I remember we were, we were, you know, service, adding services, adding services on Sunday. It was awesome. God was doing so many cool things, and, and we were up to five services on Sunday. We'd do four in the morning, come back on Sunday night, and do one, one more, the same service, and I was preaching all of them. We were all getting exhausted, as you might imagine. It was, a, it was a lot. It was a lot to go with. We realized we have to do something. This is not sustainable. <laughs> we, need, we, need to, we need to be able to seat more people at the, you know, pro, you know optimal times on Sunday. So, started praying through and looking at all the options. One of the things I asked our staff and our members to do back then is to pick a day of the week and to fast and to pray together. And I remember we started this process and and building this room you're sitting in right now, right? We were were building this room and the closing is coming, you know, it's coming closer and closer and we are short like $200,000, and I'm over here going, oh, Lord, I'm going to look like the biggest jerk. Like, why would anybody ever follow my leadership? This was a terrible idea. I'm just like, I'm probably oversharing right now. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you've had moments like that, though, right? You can relate. Like, it, it, it's, it's, when you, you, don't, you haven't seen it all come through, and like the, the, the cliff is coming soon, and you're going to have to jump. And it's like, I hope, Lord, you're going to catch us. And we were praying, and we were fasting. And in the nick of time, God provided every dime we needed. And we're obviously sitting in the building now. <laughs> kind of, you know, you probably figured out the end of the story. But, um, but God provided. He blessed. He made it possible. And that all the, where it used to be an auditorium, now it's all these classrooms for these beautiful kids that are being taught about the Word of God and how Jesus loves them. And it's just awesome to see how he has done this, but it was, it was a moment of, God, we don't know the way forward. We need your power. We need your clarity. We need your guidance. My question for you is, 
Where might you need that today? You see, fasting unclutters and de-stresses your your spirit from the things of this world and makes you sensitive to the things of God. That's what it does for us. You see, Jesus thought that this was so incredibly important and so appropriate for every generation that you would know about how to do this. So what are you facing right now? What are you facing right now that could be massively improved by seeking God through prayer and fasting? Maybe there's something in your life where you've been struggling with your flesh, your body, your desires, your fleshly desires, instant gratification for a long time, and you come to the conclusion, I can't fix this on my own. I need God's help. I'm not going to be able to create this breakthrough in my own power. I need God's help for that breakthrough. Where is that happening for you right now? This is such an important question for you to be able to ask and to be able to apply what we've talked about today to what you're going through, okay? And here's the, the, the prayer, the application prayer. I'm asking you to pray with me. is simply saying, Lord Jesus, show me where your teaching on fasting could benefit my life. Where does all this need to be brought to application in me? I commit to deny my flesh in order to seek you to gain power, clarity, and guidance from God. I invite you into my life right now. To invite him in the middle of your situation. Invite, you, invite him in the middle of a decision you've been trying to make. Invite him into the middle of a relationship that you know has not been God-honoring. Or in the middle of a financial stress that you feel, career stress, your kids, your parents, any number of things that could be causing this. And it's time. God's saying, I'm here. I'm available. But you've got to seek me. You need to take the step so that I can speak to you. What do you say? Would you be willing to do it? I want to ask you right now, if you would, bow with me in prayer. And I want to pray for you. And I want to ask you to pray for yourself. That even in this prayer, for those of you who have never started a relationship with Jesus Christ, that you could begin that relationship with him right here, right now. All across this room right now, God, I pray for every single person who is going through a struggle. There's been an ongoing fight in their heart, in their mind. Maybe it's not feeling enough. Maybe it's not performing well enough. Not being successful enough, smart enough, good looking enough, spiritual enough. All the enoughs, God, we just, we're not, we don't feel enough. And you would tell us, stop trying to be enough for people. Put your eyes on me, your heavenly Father would say, because I love you. And through Jesus Christ, you are already enough. His righteousness puts you in right standing with me. It is through receiving what Jesus has done for you that erases all your sin. It, it brings forgiveness where you need it most. And right now, all across this room, if you would say, there is a struggle I've been going through. I have been wrestling with my flesh over and over and over and over and over. And it is time to surrender it fully to God right now, right here. And it's time to say, yes, I'm going to incorporate fasting or I'm going to incorporate abstinence into my life, the spiritual discipline. Yes, I'm going to do it. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I'd love to pray for you right now. Yes, thank you. Hands going up, the balcony, the floor. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for the courage, the faith being demonstrated right now. I pray, God, for every person who's saying yes. This is what I came for. This is the breakthrough I need. This is the moment where I'm stepping out with God. I'm going to deny myself and I'm going to embrace what God has for me. Would you just say to him right now, Lord, I trust you. Help me to step out of these fleshly desires and begin to pursue you like never before. I trust you. I trust you, Lord. I want to walk in your kingdom. You may lower your hands. And Lord, right now, all those who can hear my voice, 
who have never asked Christ to come into their life, you, you would be honest and say, I don't know Lord, the Lord Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Like, I'm not walking with God. I'm not a child of God right now. I'm mean, like, I know information about God, but I don't know him intimately, personally. Jesus came to be able to remedy that. He came to be able to, to heal that, that in curable wound of sin that is in all of us would you right now just own up to it and just be honest with God just say God that's me I've been far from you for so long and I'm so sick of living like this I don't want to live like this anymore and right now I just invite you into my life would you forgive my sin and be the Lord of my life please God and he tells us that if any one of us calls out, repents, turns our heart to you, that he will save us. And the, the population of heaven breaks into celebration over even just one person. And right, here, right now, in this room, would you be willing to say, yes, I'm asking Jesus to forgive my sin and be the Lord of my life right now, right here. If you would, just raise your hand all over the room. Would you raise your hand? I'm, I'm, giving, I'm asking Christ. God bless you, ma'am. I see you right there, right here, over there, right back over here. God bless you. Right back over here on the left side. In the balcony, I see you, buddy, right there. God bless you. Praise God in heaven over the lives that are being transformed in our presence today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Only you could do this. Thank you for the relevance and the power that your sermon is still just as powerful today as the day you said it. The moment that it came out of your lips, right down to this moment, it still has the power to transform lives. We praise you for that. May we continue to come back to you, Jesus because where else can we find the words of life, as Peter said, than you. You are the only one. We love you. We praise you. I pray, God, that you would help every person making a decision to follow you today. They would share that with somebody. They would celebrate with them, and they would trust us, begin to take next steps so we might help them to walk, take those next steps into joy, peace, love, power, guidance, clarity that come only from you. We pray all this in the incredible name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys. Next week, we're going to talk about the number one struggle of most marriages, money. Don't miss that. We'll see you then. <laughs>